So uh, yes, it, it was a good salary job. I gave up to earn nothing for the first couple of years, put your house on the line and take all the risk. But it's just the best thing I ever did. Loved it. He asked me that classic question, if you had lots of cash, what would you do with it in this business? And it's super useful to have somebody that you can just turn to because otherwise running your own business is a very lonely place. But when you've got a shareholder whose cash is on the line, they're very, very focused and they will give you the right advice. I guess what I'm saying is if you're going to have an earnout, make sure that it's not just you that benefits from it or the targets of the earnout, but it's the acquiring organisation. Today, I'm delighted to be joined by Matt O'Donnell, founder and CEO of Wi-Fi Spark, a leading specialist in providing commercial Wi-Fi solutions to large venues. I'm Mark Greaves from PKF Francis Clark, and I'll be your host. Don't forget to subscribe to this podcast to get updates and notifications on when our latest episodes are available. Hi, Matt. How are you today? I'm very well. Uh, nice to be here. Uh, I've, uh, I'm actually pleased to say um, they let me out of the office today and uh, I'm in our northern office in Pontefract, uh, whereas our headquarters is in Exeter. So it's nice to be out and about for once. But especially after the last couple of years, being let out is a bit of a pleasure, I would imagine. It is, yes. Uh, and doing our fair share of working from home. Um, but uh, now that we have officially opened our offices in Exeter, um, the local council have decided to dig up the roads and make it incredibly difficult to get in. So it's <laughs> one thing after another, really. But uh, no, doing very well. And uh, pleased to be talking to you today. Ideal. Well, we might come back and talk about transport and offices and the new modern age and Wi-Fi when we get on to it. Uh, but let's start. Let's give our listeners a bit of a background on what does Wi-Fi Spark actually do? Okay, that's uh, that's a good question. We are, despite the name uh, Wi-Fi, uh, we are uh, not only a Wi-Fi company, we are also a provider of uh, patient entertainment systems for hospitals. And I'll come on to why we got into that market later. Um, but we are a software development house uh, with exceptional capabilities when it comes to large Wi-Fi deployments and the management thereof. So I like to say to our customers and prospects, uh, we do Wi-Fi in very hard to do Wi-Fi places. And you're gonna see us in venues such as football and rugby stadiums. Um, we do some of the largest high street brands. And I would be safe in saying that you have more than likely used our Wi-Fi networks or a Wi-Fi network powered by Wi-Fi Spark at some point in your, your roaming around the country. So we're a back office provider of um, very large scale industrial strength Wi-Fi systems. Um, and whilst we started out with the humble beginnings of uh, B&Bs in, uh, in the Torbay region, uh, we're now powering some worldwide brands um, and uh, many millions of, uh, of users being processed by our system. Could you give us a couple of examples of your larger projects that you've done, if you're allowed to talk about them? Of course, yes. Um, so you will see us um, in brands such as, um, I mean, on, on the high street, you've got names like Wilco for sort of in-store uh, Wi-Fi. Um, we have Starbucks as a customer of ours. Um, and I think of note, the largest customer, um, bar none, is the NHS. So we provide Wi-Fi to most of the country's large acute hospitals. And when I say we provide the Wi-Fi, um, the interesting thing is these hospitals actually have Wi-Fi networks already. And those networks are for clinical access for the healthcare professionals, uh, clinicians and doctors to access their stuff. What we do is we use that same Wi-Fi asset, which has cost millions of pounds. Um, we can overlay our services on top to provide access to patients, to visitors, uh, but also to members of staff, because um, funnily enough, the Wi-Fi networks in hospitals are, are rather locked down um, and staff may not be able to get onto their social networks uh, when they're back in their uh, accommodation uh, unless there is a public Wi-Fi network um, for them. I, I want to come back and explore that NHS and that hospital side of things, given the background of the NHS side of things. But let's start, let's come back to where we, the real beginning of this. Where did the business start from your perspective? Okay, it actually started in Torquay Marina. And um, this is in 2003. Uh, I had a, a boat 
Um, I think at some stage, um, most blokes go through the idea of it's a great idea to buy a boat. Um, but you know the adage of there are two good days in boating, the day you buy it, the day you sell it. Um, I was sort of in between those days with my boat in Torquay Marina, um, but I also worked for an American organization selling software to large telco operators. So I needed to be able to be on the internet. And back in 2003, the options for internet access were pretty much limited to dial up or uh, an ADSL, so a fixed connection. Um, and mobile internet wasn't really much of a thing. Um, so I had this bright idea of providing internet access for marinas using a new technology called Wi-Fi. And the geek in me remembers its standard was 802.11b. Um, and don't ask me for the rest of them because you'll be here all day. And so I got hold of some technology um, and two of the developers who actually worked for me in this American company, um, we weren't particularly happy with how the firm was going. So I approached them and said, hey, guys, I've got an idea. And we formed a company. Uh, we wrote some software uh, and being in or from the telecoms background, this software was designed to be very robust, very scalable, um, bulletproof software. Uh, to provide internet access. And I approached MDL Marinas and said, um, how do you feel about me installing Wi-Fi in Torquay Marina? And the then IT director, a gentleman called Malcolm Grubb, um, I, I managed to get an audience with him. And he said, you're the 17th company to see me about Wi-Fi, you've got 20 minutes. And after about an hour and a half, um, we, we really hit it off. He gave me permission to install in two of his marinas in um, Brixham and, uh, and Torquay. And um, after a little bit of time, Malcolm was actually our first shareholder in, uh, in the business, which uh, I'll come on to later. But uh, we rapidly got to the point where our solution was trusted. And because we were in that position of developing software really quickly, um, I could go along to customers, do a bit of a sales schmooze, and, uh, and say, what would you like it to do? And they'd say, I want it to do this and that and the other. And I'd just nod my head and say, okay, give us a little bit of time. And we'd come back and we'd show it to them. So this was the epitome of agile software development. Um, and, um, and as a result, the business uh, grew um, rather rapidly. But for your individual perspective, you therefore went from working in a large organisation yes. as part of a division etc reporting out lots of reporting lines and all that type of stuff yeah. to actually stepping out on your own with a couple of other people by your side yeah. was that frightening scary or just a natural development um it, it was exciting and i spent most of my life before wi-fi spark either on an airplane or in an airport departure lounge or in a meeting room uh, with some telecoms types and after having done that for a couple of decades, you kind of get a bit fed up with it. When you spend such a lot of time um, away from home, um, working for somebody else who doesn't really respect you as a, an individual, and you think, I could do something else and I could really make a difference. And it was the best thing I ever did to get out of the rat race of sales and the commercial element of it um, for um, American organizations who were focused on massive growth um, and um, everything that goes along with that, um, to dive into your own business, take a risk, and it was a big risk, but to do something that you're really passionate about, that you enjoy. And then working 12 hours a day, it ain't a problem. Um, but when you're doing it for somebody else and there's no appreciation, um, it, it does kind of focus the mind a little bit. So, uh, yes, it, it was a good salary job. I gave up uh, to earn nothing for the first couple of years, put your house on the line and take all the risk. But it's just the best thing I ever did. Loved it. Well, you're probably slightly young at the time, but midlife crisis is meant to be buying the boat, not sat on the boat and deciding, oh, yes, let's all jump off into the sea and make sure, see if we can swim or not at that stage. Yeah. It would have been a good time. You were, you're effectively describing riding the wave of Wi-Fi at that stage, you know, with lots of other younger companies. Um, not necessarily riding the wave of uh, Wi-Fi, but riding the wave of the internet. And uh, it was shortly after that that the iPhone was released. And you know, don't, don't ask me for tech tips, because I remember looking at that thinking that will never catch on. <laughs> and um, 
what the iPhone brought us was that ubiquitous access to stuff that we need to get at on the internet. But what the iPhone really needed was connectivity. And the mobile networks, uh, 3G was not really that effective for carrying large volumes of data. And without getting too techie, <clears throat> 3G came along. I had dinner with uh, one customer who said, 3G is going to kill your business. Um, but Wi-Fi had just released its latest standard, which was like five times the speed of 3G. And then I remember a few years later, somebody else <clears throat> I was uh, having a conversation with saying 4G is going to kill your business. Um, and then the next standard of Wi-Fi came along. But it's not just the internet access, it's also the data collection. And in the world of analytics that we live in now, um, there is so much that you can get <clears throat> from uh, user behavior, um, kind of shopping uh, habits of users. Um, Amazon makes most of its money and its predictions based on the data it collects. Um, Google, don't need to say anything about those guys. Um, but even a small network operator like Wi-Fi Spark collects a vast amount of data uh, which we share with our customers on a customer by customer basis so that they can gain an insight into their users. Now, it's very different in a hospital. There's no real data exchange there. Uh, everything is totally nailed down in terms of privacy. But some of our retail customers want to know how long people spend in stores, how often they come back. So the, the Wi-Fi bit is a bit of a misnomer. Um, it's an enabler. It's a technology, but consider it like a bit of wire. It relays the information, but it's what you do with it and the data analytics um, that becomes interesting. And obviously we've got tons of that through the millions of users that, uh, that use our network. Uh, the supermarkets have been after that sort of data for years and years about how customers interact, where they walk around the stores, how often they come back, et cetera. Really, I think the original Tesco's loyalty card was launched and then they had to delay it for a few years because they didn't have the computing power to deal with the information they got provided with it, it's a huge area um but strangely enough uh wi-fi spark has moved a little bit away from that now um concentrating on the bit that i i used an expression earlier on uh, want to make a difference um and the passion in the business uh, from myself and the team of people that work with me is that we love technology and we love deploying it somewhere that actually makes a difference to people's lives. And this is where we go back into the health service um, where we're able to connect people who would not otherwise be able to connect with their loved ones. But when you're sat in a hospital bed, you do need engagement. Um, you need to be able to speak to your loved ones. And if you haven't necessarily got um, the ability to make a mobile phone call because there's no signal where you are, you need something. Um, so we're deploying this technology now, which is not Wi-Fi, um, hence the, uh, you know, why we've got Wi-Fi Spark, uh, Wi-Fi in our name. Um, our patient entertainment systems are just the next great thing in terms of making a difference. So we're able to offer TV services, internet access, get to your Netflix, um, games, um, links through to patient records, electronic meal orderings, a whole a load of stuff that we can provide that is making a difference to people's lives um, who would otherwise be somewhat isolated. Anyway, I, I don't want to turn this into a product push. Uh, apologies, no, no. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's absolutely fine. I want to come back and explore that in terms of the um, NHS situation overall. But yeah. I pick up on your make a purpose thing. We've had a theme, as our listeners will know, for the last few podcasts that seems to have been refined over the last couple of years by people being much more focused on wanting to be employed by or in partnership with a business that is clear about its end purpose and that end purpose doing more than just making the next million pound profit or whatever. And I tie into that purpose from you. How would you define your purpose in a few words? Do you use that internally? We do, absolutely. So we have um, what's called our one-page strat plan, our strategy plan, um, and um, each quarter we revise this, um, but we have a clear definition of our values, um, our kind of uh, values and culture statement, but um, uh, as well as um, our reason for being here, uh, we set our big, hairy, audacious goal um, and how we are going to achieve it. This is communicated to every member of the team. Every employee in Wi-Fi Spark uh, gets to see this and gets to participate in it. Transparency is absolutely the name of the game. 
Um, and I, I say it quite often during the day when I speak to the people I work with, um, we're, we're all here to do a job. I get to do CEO type things. Um, a bench technician may get to repair things. Uh, each role is equally important uh, and has a contribution to make. And we all know where the business is headed. And this might sound a little bit cliche, but um, I would like to be sat in a pub with some of my staff in a few years time, looking back at what we did and saying, yeah, we did that. Wasn't that an amazing journey? And look what we've achieved. But none of it is about money. Um, the, the money is a consequence, um, but the reward that you get is knowing that you've actually done a good job and it satisfies your conscience. Um, you really feel you've contributed and, and made a difference. Do you find that uh, allows you to take a different approach in recruitment? Obviously, you're recruiting IT people at the moment is quite difficult, to say the yep. least. Does that added value allow you to differentiate yourself? Um, differentiation in recruitment is, is important. Um, the overall workplace environment scenario has changed somewhat as a result of COVID. Um, in, in our example, um, I remember it was just over... <sighs> probably about 114 weeks ago, uh, I sent everybody home because we were all worried about what's going to happen with COVID. Um, all of my guys and gals have had the option of working from home ever since. Um, but the new normal is uh, work from home is the normal. Coming into an office uh, occasionally is fine um, for some uh, town hall meetings perhaps or some specific purposes, but it's not being enforced on people. And that forms part of the recruitment. So I think as an industry, uh, not just Wi-Fi Spark, but many other companies are now moving towards a, um, well, as long as you do the job, we don't really mind. We don't mind where you are. Uh, we don't really mind what hours you work, um, as long as there are certain. So we don't mind um, where you're working from, um, as long as you do the job. And this is where um, we're perhaps um, now a little bit ahead of the game in that we set very clear objectives for our employees so that they know what is expected um, from the perspective of setting a scorecard out. So these are the things we want you to achieve each quarter. Uh, we measure against those. How you do it, we don't mind. So we talked earlier about getting investments from a couple of individuals. We talked about Malcolm and the Marines and that type of thing. How did that shape the journey? How did that work, working with a couple of individuals who'd actually put money into the business? Okay, it's a really good question. Um, first of all, they were what I would call silent partners. So um, they didn't have much interaction with the business, but they had a lot of faith in it. So Malcolm was, um, was actually our first customer. Um, and... Um, I don't know if you remember um, the, the Blackadder episode where Blackadder was looking for a best man and Lord Percy wanted to be best man. And Blackadder said, Percy, I don't suppose you know of anyone who could be my best man. <laughs> um, and it was almost like that with Malcolm because I was talking to Malcolm about, you know, I wanted to grow the business um, and um, I would be considering investment. Um, and Malcolm was sort of hopping up and down and waiting for me to ask him, and I didn't. I didn't even consider him. And he had to sort of point out the bleeding obvious to me to say, uh, well, actually, Matt, I might be interested. So um, Malcolm uh, bought 15% of the business in the very early days. A really shrewd move for Malcolm. Um, I can't disclose how much he paid, but let's just say it, um, it contributed greatly at the time to the business. And um, and allowed me to spend some money uh, in areas for recruitment and, uh, and development, which is really good. Um, and a couple of years later, uh, another customer, a gentleman called Tim, um, came along. We were having dinner uh, one evening, and uh, he asked me that classic question, if you had lots of cash, what would you do with it in this business? So I just rattled off a whole load of, oh, I'd get this, I'd do this, and develop one of these and get sales, and maybe do this thing called marketing, which apparently is very good. Um, and, uh, and he said, okay, how about this much? And it was one of those, oh, okay, moments. Um, but both Malcolm and Tim are very smart guys. And when I say they were silent partners, they were great advisors. And when you're an entrepreneur, it's very lonely. Um, when you gain two shareholders, not only do you get some money, which can de-risk you, 
uh, which makes you feel a lot better. Uh, but also you get two guys that you can go and talk to and you can phone them up and say, what do you think I should do about this? Um, and I did that on many occasions with both Malcolm and Tim. Uh, Tim helped me out with a particularly difficult situation. Um, and it's super useful to have somebody that you can just turn to um, because otherwise running your own business is a very lonely place. And going to your contemporaries, um, you know, your, your, your peers in other businesses, um, they're not necessarily as helpful as you might think. And they probably haven't experienced what you're experiencing. But when you've got a shareholder whose cash is on the line, they're very, very focused and they will give you the right advice. So having those guys on board was massively helpful to me, not just from the money point of view, um, but for the other reason of demonstrating faith in the company. And when you come to sell a business, if you've got two shareholders who've come in at different stages after the business was running, then your your prospective buyer is going to look at that and think, well, they bought a bit of it and they've been around and they're quite happy and the thing has grown like crazy since. So that does help as well. And also when it comes to the sale of the business, you need somebody to talk to. Um, Francis is quite brilliant, um, but having shareholders as well, it's really a question of what do we do here, guys? Should we do it rather than should I do it? Um, so it was really good having them uh, come on board and um, uh, and they they certainly helped grow the business in those early years. Well, certainly that loneliness of the entrepreneur is one of those key rationales why businesses don't develop out as fast or to their ultimate prospects because you've got no one just to turn to when you're facing a hard decision you talk about or just when you're just having a hard time and you just need you don't really need advice you just need someone to listen to you exactly yeah, yeah. we've seen that time and time again about getting the right people involved the issue is finding the right people or yes. in your case stumbling across them by accident at that stage um, you mentioned the sales side of things so you started as you built it up gained pretty good highlight um, customers um, you then have grown it and then a couple of years ago you did a, a transaction with a Canadian group how did that come about what were you trying to do at the time um, I wasn't actually trying to do anything um, and um, two years maybe three years before the transaction um, Valaris uh, came along to see me just to kick the tyres. Um, they, uh, they, they got this gentleman uh, called Lawrence um, who came along and uh, Lawrence and I had a chat about the business um, and I didn't really think much of it at the time. But what I realised is that I was being scoped out to see, OK, this looks like an interesting firm. Um, they're maybe not quite as big as we need them to be just yet, but they're doing all the right things. Um, so we were very much on their radar. Um, now, the actual uh, thing that happened is Lawrence kept in touch, uh, came to see me each year, uh, and that was great. Um, and um, we then were introduced uh, through a, a, a contact of mine to a, a publication called Megabyte, uh, B-U-Y-T-E. Um, and they are a, an online publication that specialise in M&A um, and, you know, the buzz of what's going on in the industry, who's looking at who, which companies are accelerating and I was told, go and speak to, to this, uh, this outfit. And I did. And they did a little piece on us. And um, I think it went live the Monday morning. And by the Monday afternoon, I had 11 appointments from prospective suitors, PE, houses, um, trade sales. And it was like, wow. Um, and obviously, um, Valaris was, uh, was part of that as well. Um, this was... Um, at an interesting time for the business because we were doing okay, but I'd reached the point where the business was had hit a bit of an EBITDA ceiling and um, I knew it could do much more, but I wasn't really able to take it to its next level. So I realized this is the time to get somebody else in. Um, and I looked favorably at um, PE um, as uh, we had three companies um, who put uh, ultimately put an offer in uh, with us. Uh, there was one trade sale um, and, um, and there was Valaris. And Valaris had a very different message to, to everybody else. Um, now, I've grown this business over nearly two decades. I've seen people um, join the company. Um, I've seen them get married, have kids, have divorces, have deaths in the family. 
I've supported them. They've become my friends. Um, my customers have become friends as well. Um, goodness, you know, Malcolm became an investor and he was he was a customer. Um, you build up a, a real nucleus of, of people and it sort of becomes all encompassing. It becomes your life. So when it came to trade sale, um, I had a rather aggressive offer, um, which I thought, well, if I do that, they're just going to strip this business down. Uh, it would have gone to a competitor actually in the States. They would have just taken the software and probably dismembered the rest of the company and I'd have been gone. You know, it was, there's your money, Matt, off you go. And I didn't really like the idea of walking down the high street, bumping into employees saying, hi, how are you doing? And they say, oh, I'm still looking for a job. And me saying, well, I'm all right. I've got millions. It's great. Um, so that, that's not me. Um, and I wanted to keep everything intact. Um, going down the PE route um, was, was quite interesting. Um, and um, I, I think you know what happens with PE. They put people in. You get a couple of people on the board. You might get a chairman along. Um, they're usually very aggressive. They want three times um, after a few years, and then they'll flip you and move you on to a bigger PE house, hopefully. And I didn't really want to get bounced around like that um, and, uh, and have somebody come in and change everything. Um, so Valaris came along and said, well, uh, we like what you're doing. We'd like you to keep doing what you're doing. And we're going to give you a bit of help. Um, but we're not going to put anybody on your board. We're not going to replace you. Uh, we're going to give you a realistic earnout, um, and you're going to have to work hard, but we're going to help you every step of the way. The difference with Valaris is they've never sold a company. And whilst their initial offer may not have been as great as a trade sale, the long-term prospects looked a lot brighter um, as compared to, to the others. Uh, there's no nonsense about being flipped in three years. Um, their business model demonstrates progressive, good, organic growth. Um, and they're also somewhat formidably large in terms of cash. And, um, and whilst we perhaps shouldn't have been allowed to so early on in the, the, uh, the acquisition stage, we were probably eight months in after being acquired, um, we were given the opportunity to go out and acquire probably our biggest competitor. And for me, it was like all my Christmases come at once. And I could never have got that um, if I'd have gone down a different route. Um, or maybe I could, but probably not as easily and not with the guys um, who are supporting this business. Um, they're very different from a, a typical PE or, or VC house. Um, and I found working with these individuals who are pretty humble, despite what they've achieved, um, who are extremely focused, who have great data. Um, they're just really good people to work with. And they have they've maintained everything that they said would happen after the acquisition um, that, uh, that they promised. And that's always a worry. When you're an entrepreneur and you sell your business, you think, am I going to get stitched up as soon as they bought me? And a lot of people do. Um, but what was really weird about the transaction for me is that on the day I had to make an announcement to the whole company, uh, which I had to do on Teams uh, because of being in the middle of lockdown. Um, and, um, and I was sat in my, my chair at home um, and at nine o'clock in the morning, I was the owner and CEO of Wi-Fi Spark. At about five past nine in the morning, I was the founder and CEO of Wi-Fi Spark and nothing had changed apart from my bank balance. And that is a really strange feeling. So I was still doing exactly the same thing. Um, I still had exactly the same staff, but now it's like I had a big brother next to me saying, it'll be all right, we'll take care of you. Anything you need, just call us. And by the way, here's a bit of advice and here's a load of secrets that we didn't tell you before we bought your business, which we're gonna tell you afterwards about how to grow and make your business even better. And I kind of wish they told me all that before because I never <laughs> have sold it. Um, <laughs> And so, there, there is a, a sort of circular argument in there. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I, can I just pick up on that that five minutes past nine and nine o'clock yes. transition, if you like, to what what has been those key changes afterwards? What do you find on a day to day, month to day, month basis that is different now that you're owned? It's no longer just yours. Okay, um, so on the um... I was going to say bad side but it's not bad at all it's actually really good 
Um, but when you're an independent entrepreneur who can do whatever they, they want, whenever they want, um, anyone who invests in a business wants to know how that business is doing. Uh, Valaris is very much data driven. Um, so quarterly reporting is a big thing. Monthly reporting is a big thing. Um, and again, when you're running your own business, you might not pay as much attention to how well your business is doing because you're too busy running your business. So what Valaris have brought in is a real amount of discipline of what does good look like and how do you measure it? So the biggest change for me is realizing you can benchmark every area of a software development business such as ours. And when you've got another 680 plus companies in your portfolio, you've got a load of people to benchmark it against. So that was probably the biggest change was all of a sudden being able to be measured for how effective various parts of my business are um, and then knowing what I need to do about it. Um, the other change I think is access to information and best practice. Um, before I would have had to have gone to, if I needed financial best practice, I'd have picked up the phone to PKF Francis Clark and said, hey chaps, how do you fancy coming in and me paying you a load of consultancy money <laughs> you need to tell me what to do. Um, and uh, I know you, know, we, you have helped us out massively, um, but Valaris has got analysts, they've got lawyers, they've got people who know this stuff and being able to access that information um, and really understand what you're looking at has been fantastic. So in a real world example of that, we used to um, do quite a lot of, well, we still do quite a lot of Wi-Fi for rail. And so we do most of uh, uh, the Arriva uh, Wales. Uh, we do um, TPE, we do Chilton Rail, or not on the trains, because that's appalling, um, but on the stations, we do that bit. Um, but when we looked at the total available market, um, or rather when Valaris got one of their analysts to look at our markets, they said, these are your markets. This is retail. This is healthcare. This is transportation. Look how little there is in transportation. And when they show you, they, they benchmark that against the other markets, you can see really quickly, okay, I know where I need to spend my time now, which is why Spark is now focused quite heavily on healthcare, because that's where we can get the best bang for the buck, where we can make most of a difference. Um, and where we're in a much more commanding position. Whereas perhaps two, three years ago, I'd be chasing after million pound contracts in rail that were not very profitable and were extremely hard work, um, still great projects, um, but for what we do, our time and effort and focus may be best served elsewhere. Now, we've realized in retail, the bit that we can do is the overlay network again. Uh, we're probably better than anybody um, at doing that for an existing infrastructure, just like we do in the health service. But we're moving away now from drilling holes and pulling cables, quite labor intense work for physically installing. Uh, we're now becoming the overlay network that goes on top of the existing infrastructure, which actually makes our proposition better than that of our competitors. So having access to that, that G2, that Intel, that intelligence of what the markets look like and how your products map against them. Um, that's been a big change for me as well, because I'll be honest with you, as an entrepreneur, you wake up one morning and think, I've had a good idea, let's do that. And you go out and do it and um, you should fail fast. But if you don't, a lot of entrepreneurs will carry on flogging a dead horse because they're too proud to give it up. Um, there's none of that now. You know, Data-driven decisions is what it's all about. That's one of the key things. Half the lessons of being an entrepreneur is learning what not to do yes. rather than learning what to do. And those are very hard lessons at that stage. Yeah. Um, you mentioned about an earn out within there, i.e. Yeah. Um, consideration of the deal that's um, paid afterwards and subject to conditions. Yeah. A lot of entrepreneurs are really, really anti earn outs and very nervous about them. Yes. What, what would you say? What's your experience on that side? Um, from what I've heard from friends and colleagues who have also sold their businesses, earnouts are a bad thing and are to be avoided um, because you're probably going to get stitched up. Um, it's not always the case. It depends on who's buying you and what their intentions are. So if you consider uh, if a business is being bought as a trade sale, um, usually earnouts are going to be really bad news um, because they're probably you're not going to get the opportunity to run your business the way you want with the support you need to to achieve that earnout. 
not always, but uh, but certainly sometimes. If the business is being acquired um, to grow um, and realistic growth targets are set on the business, then earnouts could actually be a good thing. And if you're quite smart as an entrepreneur, you should know what your business prospects are and what its capability is likely to be in the future. And you balance that off against the offer that is made such that your earnout is something that you know you can achieve. If you know you can achieve it and you've got an organization who wants to buy you and keep you forever, you've got a very good chance of hitting that earnout. So I, I'll be really open with you. I'm not going to share numbers with you, but um, the earnout that, uh, that I was presented with was very reasonable. Um, year one did great. Um, but in the middle of year one, um, we went out and acquired another business, which kind of changed the landscape a bit. So um, given that it changed the landscape, um, I discussed with our buyer, Valaris, to say, look, it's a bit of a different picture now, and this may have an effect on my earnout. What do you think? And they said, no problem, let's change it and let's adapt it. We still want you to grow the business, but we're prepared to do this and to do that for you. And I've, I'm honestly blown away by how supportive they have been for me to achieve what I, I need to or want to from the earnout. So having the support from an organization um, will be there if they are going to succeed, if you succeed, if it's a mutual benefit. Uh, and for the case of Spark, if Spark grows at a certain rate, if our recurring revenue increases at a certain rate, we hit all the IRR targets. Uh, it means the business model works. You know, other people above me get their bonuses and their rewards. It all stacks up and it flows into the, the greater, um, larger entity of Valaris. So I guess what I'm saying is if you're going to have an earnout, make sure that it's not just you that benefits from it uh, or the targets of the earnout, but it's the acquiring uh, organization so what is the benefit to the acquiring organization if your own out says you've got to double your ebit after three years if that's going to make a massive difference to their irr then you know they will do everything they can to support you in getting your own out um, but be a little wary of um of your typical you know let's set the bar really really high so we can't make it and we don't have to pay him um, there is still a bit of that that goes on i'm sure um, and just make sure that there is a mutual benefit for both parties if the earnout is hit. And that's been absolutely the case for me. So um, I don't want to sound too smug, um, but um, Spark is in a good place and is being very well supported. I think that feeds into something we try within deals to look at is the feel of the partner. It's getting a level of trust and understanding, understanding that mutual benefit, but also the feel that develops over a deal of are these people that we're going to be able to do business with? And it's intangible. It's really difficult, but it's something that we do come back to time and time again before you do a deal is, are you sure? Are you really sure? And it's less about the mechanics and the urinates to a certain extent. They've got to make sense. It's more about that flavor and feel. The mutual benefit is that phrase. It is. And the, the people is a very strong thing. Uh, we all buy from people that we, we like and we admire. Um, and it was the case with Spark. I got on really well with the Valaris guys. They're very down to earth. I said they're quite humble. Um, and given what they've achieved, it, you know, it's amazing. Um, but I did see that. The, the pattern of growth that they demonstrated on other companies. And there was a real feeling of, I want some of that. Mm -hmm. And the other thing to bear in mind is um, uh, Valaris is, is actually a very small organization. It comprises of many, many hundreds of companies, but they don't have a load of CEOs sat on the bench waiting to take your place. Uh, they don't have sales directors waiting to step in and replace your staff. They want you to do it. They've got analysts and lawyers and, you know, m a guys as you would expect um, and this is something that francis clark pointed out to me uh, when i was a little nervous about well what happens could they just get rid of me um the next day after acquisition um the answer was well pretty unlikely really because i've got nobody to replace you with um and you know there isn't a whole set of substitutes waiting to go in um and doing a bit of due diligence on this you have to look at what the the track record of that organization is um how many principles of the original procure businesses are still in post uh, like 75 percent that's unheard of you know most of them clear off as soon as they can 
um, because they don't like it and they don't like being managed by somebody or told what to do because us entrepreneurs are very snooty like that. But 75% retained is, you know, that that is really good. So it shows that they're looking after their people. Um, but yeah, pe people buy from people for sure. And you've got to know who you're working with are going to look after you. Definitely. And I mentioned before, I would contrast the Canadian approach with the American approach, which is of a slightly different flavour. Um, we've talked about hospitals. We've talked about um, the acquisition you did halfway into your first year. And I've just got a phrase from um, that deal where you did the deal and you're trying to ensure that no patient pays for entertainment in a hospital by 2024. Yes. How on earth can you do that? Isn't that a biggie? <laughs> so I, I'm sure many of, of your listeners will know about Hospedia. Um, Hospedia didn't have the world's best reputation um, because they were charging poor, sick patients in hospitals for watching telly um, and making phone calls. Um, and that's not a great business model, you know. Um, but because the business model that they did originally was that they invested upwards of 150 million pounds of infrastructure um, on a concession basis. So the, the NHS didn't actually pay for it. Um, the only way they could get their money back was through transactions um, and had continued to do so. So when we uh, were looking at Hospedia as an acquisition target, we thought, um, okay, they've got strong contracts in the NHS. They've put a huge amount of infrastructure in place, but the business model stinks. Um, and their reputation is suffering as a result of it, we need to turn it around. So Spark has got great technology, uh, which can fit into this environment by way of patient entertainment. Hospedia are a competitor of ours. Um, Hospedia have got great infrastructure. They've got all the bedside units. So we want to put the best of both worlds together. As a result, we went and acquired the business, um, and we are now on a mission to reverse that business model back to a trust pays model. Our proposition is that it is not just about TV, it is about the whole gambit, the patient engagement. There are hundreds of applications waiting to get into healthcare, to make life better for staff, for visitors, for patients. Um, so it's not just the patients. And the infrastructure is largely in place through Wi-Fi networks, through the Hospedia infrastructure and bedside terminals, and little things like having power and network connectivity to 56,500 hospital beds. That's quite an important thing. So if we can use this technology and get far greater value from it, which we believe we can by implementing what Spark has developed uh, on top of the Hospedia solution, we have a very compelling argument to go back to the NHS and to say for a very, very small percentage of wallet spend, you could implement, and we're talking pence per bed per day, you could implement a full a patient engagement, um, clinical access system uh, with upgraded technology um, across your entire estate. And the figures are not that great because the scale is so big, you know, we're, a, a small amount of a spend per bed on a very large number of beds makes sense for us. But the trusts are, are obviously um, a little reluctant to, to put money into something that um, they haven't had a great experience with in the past with Hospedia. Um, I'm pleased to say that the trusts, I, well, I really believe they've had a good experience with Wi-Fi Spark and they trust us. So we're, we're using our reputation and our technology to show them that there is a better way. The other thing I should mention as well is that there are some charities who are really helping us out with this. Um, many charities um, have a, a reasonable sum of money to spend on things that the trust wouldn't normally pay for. And this could fall into that category. The whole patient engagement uh, category um, has been actually funded by a number of charities in some trusts already. So we're starting to see this happening in the nhs and it's really good we've got probably four or five trusts that we've converted already to a trust stroke charity pays model and a lot of other trusts are now looking at this and they're kind of like meerkats um, when one does something the others are looking up and they see what's going on over there um, and I, I don't mean to trivialize this by any means it's a serious thing but if you do something really well 
in one or two trusts, it does have somewhat of a domino effect, but you've got to prove that it works. But I believe we can achieve it and we will do everything we can to, to achieve it. And, and it goes back to what we said right at the beginning of this podcast, why are we doing it? We want to make a difference. We want people who go into hospital and goodness knows, I spent four years uh, with both my parents on a long journey to the end of their lives through hospitals. And I've seen the difference it can make to be connected with your loved ones, to be entertained, to be engaged, to be informed. And we live in a, a, a day, an age where we carry around technology in our pockets that do this all the time. Our smartphones are there. Why shouldn't we get access to that when we're in hospitals and have even more? So get all of the, the NHS has spent thousands and thousands of pounds on healthcare videos and they're buried somewhere on an NHS website. Nobody knows where they are. Let's make them front and center to patients. So when you're having a knee operation, you know what's going to happen. Let's put the patient journey on there so that you can do everything from before you check into hospital. Um, you can create an account. You can view your treatment, your anticipated discharge date. You can see your medication. Do that all while you're in hospital. And when you've left hospital, carry on the patient journey integration afterwards. There's so much that can be done. But it, it's a golden opportunity to make a difference. And that's why we're here. That's why we're doing it. Well, you're at an exciting intersection on the basis you have that the need for that connectivity has improved for the last couple of years beyond all doubt. You've got the holistic approach that trying to get, it's not just the NHS sitting in isolation. It needs to integrate with other stuff. You also have a little bit of the edge of privatization. Private companies involved in the NHS is a, a topic which is just seems to have a taboo, but unless we do stuff like this properly for the right purpose, it's not going to happen. And we could spend years on this, but unfortunately, we're almost out of time. We always like to end with a, a more lighthearted question rather than just solving the issues of that. Holidays. We are getting back into holidays gradually at this stage. Where's your favourite holiday destination? Um, well, I think my wife would agree with this because um, uh, she gets, uh, gets to have a bit of peace away from me. Um, my favorite holiday destination is on a BMW motorbike going around the Alps or the Pyrenees. Um, and I've missed out on this for the last couple of years, but Anne very kindly allows me to escape. And I have 10 days uh, where I get on a bike and explore some brilliant countryside and some amazing roads. For me, it's, it's bikes and it's no email, no mobile phone, no blooming <laughs> Wi-Fi. <laughs> a couple of wheels and an engine is, uh, is what it is for me. I, I think that's a perfect quote at that stage. The man who runs a company called Wi-Fi Spark takes a perfect holiday destination with no Wi-Fi at that stage. It's, it's called getting away from it all. <laughs> that's ideal. Thank you so much for joining us today, Matt, um, and for sharing your story with our listeners out there. I hope they've enjoyed it as much as I have. It's been really fascinating here about your current circumstances and the changes that are possible, especially in something as emotive as hospital out there and I wish you so much luck on that side and thank you to our audience for listening to our latest episodes of Business Noodles and Doodles we hope you've enjoyed our conversation don't forget to subscribe to this podcast to get updates and notifications on when our latest episodes are available